Hello, I am Pastor Horace Dowdy in Lexington, Virginia, and each Thursday I bring you a local history lesson. And I encourage you, if you enjoy these presentations, that you click on like and then click on subscribe to Horace Dowdy YouTube. Then go to the bell icon so that you will receive notifications. And in addition, tell your friends and your family and your neighbors about this program. I appreciate it. Today, I want to talk about Native Americans here in the Valley. The painful story of our Native Americans evokes a pang of guilt. We wish it could be rewritten. The opening chapters begin well enough, but they had hope and good intentions. English kings granted permission for adventurers to settle on the shores of Virginia with one very specific provision. They were to Christianize the Indians, live peaceably among the natives, and bring to the savages the blessings of civilization. It was a noble goal. It did not work, despite enormous effort. In the years 1607 to 1618, 10,000 acres had been set aside in a place called Henrico for building a college and seminary where Indians could learn the white man's religion and culture. Anglican priests immediately began com communion classes for the Indians. It was in keeping with the charter, to the glory of God, in, uh, in honor of the head of the church, the King of England. A powerful Indian leader brought his braves in, presumably, to learn the new faith, and despite some uneasiness between the two cultures and an occasional fight, the future seemed promising. The natives taught the inept settlers how to grow corn, how to fish, how to smoke tobacco. The starvation years passed, and Virginia plantations proved fruitful. December 4, 1619, was established as a day of thanksgiving, two years before what is now erroneously called the first Thanksgiving in America at Plymouth, Massachusetts. The celebration was established at Berkeley 100 in Virginia. On the James River, things seemed to be going well. However, there were no converts. The Native Americans did not care for the customs and habits and religions of the newcomers. An exception was Pocahontas, daughter of the chief called Powhatan. And as far as I can determine, this remarkable lady is one of the very few Indians to receive Christian baptism in early America. She wanted to marry John Roth, and an essential requirement was that she join the church. In March of 1622, the wily chief showed his true intentions. His pretense at becoming a Christian was nothing more than a plan to eradicate every white settler. He and his men conducted a well-planned massacre, killing hundreds of white men, women, and children. The terrible slaughter turned the tide, but not in the way the Indians had expected. The survivors, few as they were, rallied, wiser, more determined. Conversion of Indians was forgotten. The earnest whites who had labored diligently in and for the college were all murdered, and the college expired with them. New goals were adapted in dealing with the natives, and those goals prevailed. Killing replaced conversion. Extermination replaced education. Peaceful coexistence became a lost dream. Sadly, the first chapter closed on a bitter note. More than a century later, settlers came across the mountains and began settling here in the Valley of Virginia. And although there were vague understandings that this was the Indian side of the boundary, no natives were in sight. Here were open fields and lush pastures seemingly deserted after centuries of Indian habitation. Why had the tribes moved out? Contrary to what I was taught as a child, this land was not totally covered in forest. The white settlers arrived and there were fields. Indians had 
cultivated corn. They had transformed much of the land into pasture by burning vast areas every year. And if everything were wooded, there would have been no herds of buffalo. Buffalo Creek would be called by some other name. The Scott-Irish settlers wondered if the non-resident Indians still claimed ownership. Meeting houses were constructed, one of which stood in front of current Oxford Church, built of sturdy logs, no evidence that the structure was ever used as a fort, but we do know that this was where our forefathers gathered to worship God. Many of the settlers lived out their lives, never glimpsing a Native American. Although small bands of hunters and warriors regularly passed through what is now Route 11, the Great Path. There were exceptions. In 1742, John, John McDowell, husband of Magdalena, was killed near the mouth of the Maury River, along with several of his men. They were attempting to escort 30-some Indians out of Rockbridge area. In 1759 and 1763, Shawnees attacked settlers on Cars Creek, killing and capturing as many as 100 victims. Some historians set the number much lower. Surprisingly, no official records give account of either raid, leaving the details open to speculation. In his History of Rockbridge County, Orrin Morton concludes that Indians resented the settlers' desecration of ancient holy sites and burial mounds. Although natives no longer lived here, Morton speculates that the callous attitude of white settlers was too offensive to ignore and brought on attack. And he writes of large burial mounds at Hayes Creek, Glasgow, Buffalo, all of which have been leveled by agriculture prior to 1920. Stone artifacts are discovered with regularity in Rockbridge. All such tools predate the arrival of, of American and European ancestors. Some of the implements may be tens of thousands of years old. The well-ordered grave mounds the domestic stone tools, the open meadows for corn and buffalo all prove that other people lived here many centuries ago. They revered these awesome hills, the sparkling waters and the fertile ground. Here they raised their children, here they had their dances and held their powwows in honor of the Great Spirit. It was their labor that paved the way for settlement by our ancestors and it suggests to me that we owe them something, not the least of which would be respect and understanding. I too love their land, nature's paradise, the most beautiful on earth. When I roam the mountains behind our church, I enjoy the mental game of re reconstructing history. For the past quarter million, quarter millennium, my own race and culture have lived and labored here long before there were the Indians. The land is not mine, even though my name may be on the deed. The Great Spirit loaned this country to the Red Man, who is long since gone. Now it is my turn and yours. The same Great Spirit has loaned it to me for a few years to enjoy with you while we live.